One of the things that Morgan says in his book, The Psychology of Money, is that your ability to save is the difference between your ego and your income. One of the key things to consider when you're trying to decide what game are you playing is to look at the time horizon and the goals that you have. Welcome to Perth Property Insider, where you will learn how to grow your wealth and improve your life using Perth Property. Our show is brought to you by Investors Edge Real Estate, the highly rated and award-winning property management, sales and buyers agency servicing the whole of Perth. Now, here's your host, Jared Mann. G'day and welcome to another episode of Perth Property Insider. I'm your host, Jared Mann, and today I'm going into what investing game are you actually playing? And I'm not sure if you've ever really thought about it, but it's something that's been on my mind lately. And I've been reading this fabulous book called The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. I'm actually trying to get him on the show. And I'd absolutely love it if we could deep dive with uh, Morgan. But in the meantime, go check out this book, The Psychology of Money. Awesome book. And he talks about people often look at investing as if it's a basketball game where we're all playing the same game with the same rules. But in reality, we're all actually playing different games and we've got different goals, different time horizons. And so that's why it can be really detrimental and hurt the game that you're playing by getting into a comparison with others and that might be playing a completely different game. So when we look at others and it's especially alluring when we're on Facebook and we see the shiny trappings and different things being posted and you can't help but making a bit of a comparison there. But what we can't see with these people is we can't see their level of savings. We can't see the percentage of savings, like how much are they actually saving, is what they're posting about a small percent or have they gone and chucked everything in at buying that thing? Have they? What level of debt do they have? Are they up to the eyeballs with personal debt? What level of investments does someone have? What's their net worth? And when I also think about what I see behind the scenes very often, what level of personal debt does someone have with their credit cards, with their car loans, with their various other personal loans. So it can be impossible to actually know whether someone is financially well off and what, where do these things that they're posting sort of fit into that overall picture. So you can see a car that someone drives, you can see the clothes and the jewelry that they wear, you can see the holidays that they take and post about, the school that they send their kids to. But what you can't see is those hidden, potentially more meaningful and important things. And sadly, or, you know, we can all understand why, there's a big pressure in our society to fit in with what our friends are doing. And often there's a lot of expectations that can be put on you from your industry as well. And potentially in climbing that corporate ladder, you know, if you don't show up to work in the nice suit, are you going to convince others that you're professional? Are you going to look the part when you're trying to impress your other workmates and your boss, etc.? Are you going to impress a client that you're trying to win the trust of? So there is a lot of these social expectations that get put on us and it's hard. I certainly acknowledge and feel that as well. And very often when we actually see behind the scenes of someone's reality, they can be leveraged up to the eyeballs. They can have no savings. They could be one hairline away from if they lost their job, they could be in financial ruin tomorrow. I picture that, you know, stack of cards all, you know, finally balancing and pulling one card out, it could all just fall down. So I'm not sure about you, but as I've gotten older, I consider having lots of investments and money in the bank as sexy and not the flashy appearance of money on Facebook as being sexy. So that proverbial saying of don't judge a book by its cover is so true. And some of the wealthiest clients that I have, some of the wealthiest mentors, some of the wealthiest friends that I have, you wouldn't think they were 
by what they drive, by what they wear, by how they appear on Facebook. And one of the things that Morgan says in his book, The Psychology of Money, is that your ability to save is the difference between your ego and your income. And I thought this really rings true. That might not have been exactly what he said, but I'm paraphrasing. And I certainly appreciate that there's many people that are doing it tough in this economy with rising costs, with inflation increasing the cost of everything and it's not always purely about ego we have baseline survival expenses that no matter what you do it costs to be have to live in a house it costs to bring up children it costs to do all these things so what i'm more talking about here is the ego is sort of the gap that goes that gets filled above your expenses it's the those lavish things that you do to impress others or that you do to try to play that corporate ladder game and play that looking flashy on Facebook game. So that is worth thinking about. And, you know, I just certainly appreciate that many people can be doing it tough at the moment and don't have a choice about where they're some, where the mo- most of their expenses go. It brings me to thinking about, are we trying to look good or are we trying to get ahead? And when I first started out, in real estate, this is 16 odd years ago, I used to buy a new BMW every second year. And I did it really to fit in with what I thought a successful real estate agent was and to impress others. I was attracted by that, you know, the new car smell and the shininess of it and the the variety of having a new car every second year. And what I wasn't focusing on is how much I was actually losing as a as soon as I drove that car out of the 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 lot, I was probably decreasing ten thousand dollars a year, big costs, which I justified by telling myself, you know, I can write it off against my business when other people can't. And, you know, it's necessary. But the reality was that I stopped after a while, I stopped caring about that. I loved the car that I had. So I thought there's no reason to actually change it. It was really practical, met my needs. It was super fuel efficient. I've now kept that car for the last 10 years and I've done 220,000 kilometers in it and I'm hoping that I can get another 200,000 out of it and I'm just grateful that I get to drive the car and I'm going to drive it for as long as I can and I just think that even though the running costs are a bit higher now that to maintain it, when I compare that to the depreciation of the car and what I'd lose on the value of a new car, I'm right to spend two to 3000 sometimes 5000 a year because it's certainly less than the 10000 that I'm otherwise having to spend that's hidden in the value drop of a, of a car. So I have certainly changed how I think about you know how I appear to others and I am choosing to spend the money in other areas that's going to better help me get ahead rather than spending it on cars that are the most horrible investment that we can probably ever make. (laughs) So I also joke around today with my wife that she must love me for who I am because when she met me, she couldn't have been after money because I didn't have any. (laughs) And, you know, it, it certainly takes the money out of things because we met when we were both starting out and you know when i had plenty of aspirations plenty of goals but didn't have any real money so we did the hard yards together we rented while other friends were buying the lavish homes and over extending themselves and instead we were buying investment properties and once we'd gotten married we started and we started planning a family We built a very modest home in the Swan Valley and we did that because we wanted to spend no more than 30% of our wages on total living expenses. That enabled us to save the other 70% and continue to pay down debt, get savings towards our next investment property purchase, have other money that I could put back into the business if I needed it, just built up a bit of a buffer. It uh, it positioned us to make the next investment property purchases and to ultimately upgrade our family home. So even today, after we have upgraded to a more substantial home in Wembley, my total living expenses don't exceed 10% of our wages. 
And when I look at the negative gearing of our investment properties, which are all higher quality properties uh, in Perth, Brisbane and Melbourne, that total cost to hold those properties is less than 10% of our total wages as well. So we're keeping that negative gearing manageable and I don't want it to be all consuming. And sometimes you do need to do the hard yards and pay. You might be, when you take on your first investment property, that might be taking a lot of money to maintain. But over time, as rents increase, as your income increases, as your equity increases, you you really want to start to get to a position where you're decreasing what your overall investments take. So there's a time and a place for pushing the needle. And now that we have a pretty reasonable size portfolio of investment properties, we're putting 20% of our total wages towards index funds and diversifying and getting a different type of asset that's going to be a bit more liquid if we ever need to sell part of it to you know, realize some money. But it's starting to also provide a bit of an income for us. So over the last year, we've received around $50,000 in gains from that, which we could sell part or all of it. And that's including the dividends and if we needed to, that could help offset our other expenses if we if we ever needed to. So again, I don't suggest sort of diversifying into other assets until you've got your property working for you and you've got enough of an asset base in that area. And so we're on the other side of that, but at least it, I originally started planning out this roadmap well, when I was 16 um, starting in property. So certainly didn't have all the pieces in mind and have adjusted as I go and and I'm still continuing to refine and, and plan out the future. So the other 60% of our wages after tax is going towards saving and putting that money away. So that really gives us a lot of extra peace of mind that if things change in the market or if things change in my business, I've got the money there and we are working towards a further home upgrade in the future but the savings is enabling us to do that so when i think about where i spend my money i'm more asking myself now is this going to enhance my enjoyment and fulfillment and get me closer towards my goals or is this to look good and it's worth asking that question is this what is this really going to give us give me a return on that fulfillment enjoyment and goals Or is it just going to be a shallow thing of once I get it, might make me look good to the neighbors, might make me look good to others, but, you know, is it really worth it? So our reason for moving house and upgrading previously was to get into a better school zone. We also did it with an investment mindset and it's one of the best decisions that we've ever made. And so you can combine that investment hat when you're also trying to meet those uh, other goals with a more fulfilling place to send your kids, more fulfilling community. So one other example where I choose time over money is that I've typically taken an extra day off per week for the last five years, um, ever since my first daughter was born. And I'm continuing it now with my second daughter, just turning one and taking over, looking after her one day a week. And I could make more money if I worked a full five days day week, but I value the time that I have with the girls and spending that and soon they won't even want to spend any time with me when they get a bit older. I mean, our oldest girl's in school now, so she's, you know, there five days a week. That window is just so short for us to be present and and have those meaningful experiences and, and times with them. So. I value that far more than money and that's a case where I'm choosing that fulfillment over more money. Another example I was thinking of is that when I was growing up, I went fishing with my dad and pop a lot and it was one of you know the favorite activities that I had, but I always wished that we had a boat so I could go to where the bigger fish are and go crabbing and crayfishing and you know just go on those adventures. So about two years ago i got myself a small boat which many people might see as a waste of money or that potentially about looking good but for me it's been the most wonderful way to spend time with my daughter 
who comes out with me all the time. You know, we go on adventures together. I bring friends along who have come and brought their daughter or kid as well. And it's just a fabulous way to create memories. And it's given me a great stress reduction way to spend my downtime, except for on the weekend, I did reverse it into my gutter at the front and I've damaged my boat and the gutter. So not always a stress reduction, but it has been such a wonderful and fulfilling way to spend time and spend my downtime. So I can't really put a price on what that's already returned to me. And in that case, again, it's much more about the fulfillment and the enjoyment rather than looking good doesn't even enter my mind in that decision, but other people might think it it is for that reason. So I think one of the key things to consider when you're trying to decide what game are you playing is to look at the time horizon that you have and the goals that you have. So people often think about and speak to me about selling their investment property I like to go deeper with them and ask, well, why? Why are you looking to sell? Some say, well, it's the market peak, Jared. Well, why would you still look to sell if it is the market peak? What's your time horizon here? If your time horizon is the next 10, 20, 30 years, do you really care about trying to get out at the top of the market? Do you really care if the market comes off 5 or 10% after it you know, goes up 30 or 40%? Do you really care about trying to time that exit? And yes, there's always exceptions to this because your time horizon may be much shorter. Perhaps you want to upgrade your family home and you want to get the money out and you don't you want to get as much out as possible or you want to make your upgrade of your family home before things get too expensive. So again, it comes back to your why on that time horizon and why would you do something or how does it fit with your goals so lots of people get very excited again about adding value with development or renovation i ask why if your reason around that is to attract a better quality tenant if it's to increase the income and the reduce any negative gearing that you're going to have and take your portfolio more towards uh, income focus then that's another valid reason if it's just to be sexy and tell your friends that you're a property developer and if you are going to trade off the location or the type of property that you're buying to get a much lower quality of property, you may have done much better if you'd bought something that wasn't developable in that case. The realities will soon hit home as to how much work these things are. And you've then got to ask yourself again, like, what's the value of your time? Is that going to take you away from spending time with your kids from your work where you could make more money doing your day job than potentially putting all your blood, sweat and tears into adding value through development renovation? So you've got to really think about the why and your time horizon. So other classic one is people talk about flipping houses where they buy and sell a property quickly. And I like to ask the question, well, why? I mean, if you're doing that to generate an income and if you're doing it to chunk up money to try to get ahead a bit quicker, then that can be valid reasons. But by the time you add up your entry and exit costs, you really need to be highly skilled at what you're doing and or do it in a rapidly rising market where it does carry risk because is every property that you're buying going to be suitable for holding medium to long term if the market did take a sudden change and not w- or if the price that you can get when you come to sell isn't what you thought so again I'd be asking what's your time horizon does this fit with that is it going to get you closer to your goals and what's your real reason why that you do this not just do it because you think it's a great way to invest or because your friends doing it So finally, when we're thinking about what's our time horizon, if you've been listening to this podcast, you'd know that my thinking's changed over the last decade to being a lot more long-term focused. That's my time horizon. My time horizon's 30 years. And why is that my time horizon? Because I know the power of compounding and the difference that it 
actually makes to our wealth building, it, it's almost mind-blowing what compounding can do, even with uh, modest growth rates over the long term, what you'll add in one year after you've hold, held it for even 20 years or 30 years is just astronomical in in the way that compounding works. So if I keep buying and selling properties and flipping this here and there and getting caught up in turning over properties, especially if you're doing it through development and other stuff, I did a lot of that when I was starting out and I just wish that I'd focus more on just buying properties for the long term, holding, not paying all those entry and exit costs, the taxes that you pay every time you sell, that really eats into your return and and can take you out of the compounding. And that for me is the greatest reason why I just invest for the long term. So when you know the game that you're playing, the time horizon, your goals, your game's going to really dictate your focus and what you care about. So I don't really care about how long prices increase for. It'll be nice if they increase a bit longer but in the grand scheme of things for the next 30 years does it matter if it increases in Perth for the next year or and then goes a bit flat or does it matter if it really decreases after some time no it doesn't does it matter when when is the market peak for me it doesn't matter or does it matter what the commentators and the media and the news and economists think when I'm holding for 30 years it doesn't matter. I watch it all and listen to it all and take it all in because it's of interest and it's a bit of fun to see what other people think. But is it going to change my actions and my decisions? No, it's not going to change them. I care more about is this property that I'm holding a good one to hold for the next 30 years? And I typically only have to make that decision once when I'm buying it. And then you can block out the noise you can focus on the rest of your life and what's going on, providing that you have really good property management too, by the way, something that really drives us to deliver that for people. So I'll finish this podcast by saying, what game are you playing? Have a think about it because I think having clarity on that is going to really help you decide whether you get into those comparisons. It'll help you decide what's the most fulfilling and meaningful way to spend your money. It'll help you decide to get ahead versus looking good. And it's going to really take the stress out of watching the news. Hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have, uh, leave us a review or rating, share it with some friends, and I'll catch you on the next one. See ya. Just a reminder, the information discussed in this podcast is general in nature. As we don't know your specific situation, you should always seek professional advice before taking any action. For free market reports on your suburb of interest and other helpful resources to grow your wealth, make sure you join my property investor update at investorsedge.com.au slash join. And finally, make sure you're a member of our Perth Property Investment Facebook group. To be part of the conversation with other like-minded investors, get help to your questions and get a feel for what's going on out there in the market. I'll see you in the group. Thank <music> you.